Hi everyone, I'm Catherine, my pronouns are she, her. Some of you might have heard from me before. I work in the admissions office at St Catherine's College in Cambridge, known as CATS for short. Um, and I'm joined here by a fab bunch of people for this session on looking after your mental well-being as you transition to post-16 studies, so like year 12 or equivalent. Um, but I'm going to hand over to the next person, Mary, to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Mary, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Head of Wellbeing at St Catherine's College in Cambridge. Hello, I'm Joe, he, him. Um, I'm the equivalent of Catherine, only at Brasenose College, Oxford, so the schools officer at Brasenose College, Oxford. Hi, I'm Stephanie, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm just going into my second year at St Catherine's College, and I also study Physical Natural Sciences. Hi, my name's Anita, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a theology student going into my second year at St. Catharines. Yeah, um, and hi, I'm Joel. I'm from Oxford, so I'm a Brasenose student um, and I've just finished second year English. Lovely, thank you everyone. Um, Mary's going to be leading this session, but I just wanted to quickly say that we'll mainly be using the Q&A box um, to kind of interact with you. So you can ask questions on there anonymously if you prefer, and we're gonna have a QA and a session at the end. But now I'm gonna hand over to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Wonderful, thank you, Catherine. Great, so let's let's get started. So we're gonna be thinking about looking after your well-being as you transition into post-16 studies. And hopefully it's gonna be a really um, informal and informative session. It's gonna be a chance for us to kind of share our experiences, our ideas, and I can share some of the theory around what happens with transitions and why our well-being can be impacted by transitions as well. Um, so the aims of the session will be thinking about why do transitions in our education impact our well-being or can impact our well-being sometimes? How can you feel a bit more prepared for this transition? And what strategies are we going to be thinking about that, that you can be drawing on during this time to protect your well-being and make it as positive experience as possible? Because it's a really exciting time as well. And we need to be um, looking forward, forward to this next chapter of your studies as well. Um, so please do participate. It's really important that you are going to get very bored if it's just me talking at you. <laughs> and just why we have this panel here of um, expert students to draw on as well. But please put in your questions, your comments. Hopefully we can respect each other's views and opinions and make it kind of feel like a safe space. Please take care of yourselves because we're talking about mental health and that can be a, a tricky subject to, to think about um, together. And please seek support if you need to. And the very last slide we'll be sharing is places that you can get support if things have come up during this session and you want to talk to someone with some um, special training behind it, behind them as well. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to be thinking about mental health. And what is it we mean by mental health? Well, I think the first thing to think about is that um, our mental health, our mental well-being aren't static things, they're on a continuum. And I really like this um, grid to show us that actually we can have a diagnosable mental health um, problem or illness and still experience positive mental health, positive mental well-being, and vice versa as well. So when we're thinking about transitions, I think it's um, very unlikely we're going to be on one static point for the whole transition. We may all be somewhere on that continuum and shift during a period of time. And that's healthy and that's normal, actually, if we experience some sort of shifting. But often it's to do with how we feel about the challenges that life might present to us and um, how we feel, how daunted we feel by them, which can impact our sense of well-being and impact our mental health. And so preparing for those for those transitions can be really important in protecting our well-being during these times as well. But I think the takeaway from this slide that I wanted to share is actually it's really static, it's really fluid, and it's really important for you to think, be thinking about for you, what are your kind of red flags or early warning signs if you think your mental health is being impacted neg negatively, and where do you go with that? And also to know that we can experience positive mental health even when things feel quite difficult and therefore it's not a binary thing. Okay, let's move on. So when we're thinking about the things that impact our well-being and things that um, kind of impact our sense of positive, positive self, it can be helpful to reflect on some of the push and pull factors in terms of our sense of resiliency over the last 16 months. So I've said 16 months because we're in a global pandemic. And that is obviously going to be impacting us in a variety of ways, as well as you guys being at the end of your, um, you know, under 16 studies and at a, a quite a pivotal point in your um, academic career as well. 
And so it might just be um, helpful just to take a moment just to pause and to reflect and for you to be thinking about, if you were to be thinking about yourself on the continuum of men mental health and mental and, and well-being, where would you put yourself at the moment? And what are some of the things that may be impacting where you are on that continuum? So I want to just, you know, and this is I just off the top of my head. So I'll be interested to hear the panel's views on things that might be impacted um, well-being as well. And if you want to share things that you think might resonate with the with everyone else here, please feel free to pop them in the, the QA box. But these are things that I came up with that might be impacting our sense of well-being at the moment. So most people have had a very disrupted 16 months in terms of their education, preparing for your GCSEs or your hires, not sure what to expect really with the assessments and with your grading. And that uncertainty can be really unsettling and can cause a lot of stress as well. And so that may well be impacting how confident you're feeling about the next set stage of your academic career. Thinking about your choices for your post-16 studies, whether you've had to make different choices for your subjects that you perhaps wanted to, uh, perhaps feeling that because of your disruption for the last 16 months, you don't feel quite as um, prepared or confident in, I guess, then choosing where to go next and how to perhaps um, refine your study choices. That might have been quite anxiety provoking or stressful for you. I've just put in there living in a pandemic as a 15 to 16 year old, because there's a lot of talk about living in the new normal, but actually we are still in a very, very um, unusual, strange, um, world that we're living in at the moment if you had told me three years ago that I'd be wearing masks to go to the supermarket I would have been like no we, no that's not going to happen and that's our reality and actually although human beings are very adaptable on a subconscious level we are actually still experiencing quite a lot of stress because we are in a, a crisis mode and our body is trying to protect us and keep us alive and surviving and so we're drawing, drawing a lot of adrenaline at the moment to keep us going as well. Also think, you know, for, for, I don't know for in our college community around June, um, we had quite a lot of COVID cases and therefore we had unexpected endings to our academic year. And I'm wondering if anyone else experienced that and weren't able to have the ending that they were hoping for because of COVID or because of their educational circumstances. And actually, you know, the end of year 11 or the end of your under um, 16 sort of stage of education it's a real rite of passage. You're meant to have a prom, you're meant to sign your t-shirt, you're meant to write in your um, yearbooks. Like it's really important that we mark these, um, you know, milestones. And if you haven't been able to do that in, in the way that you actually deserve to have done it, you might have some feelings of sadness, of grief, of loss, because, you know, this really important part of your, you know, life is, has not been as you'd want it to be, or how your older siblings have experienced it, or your family members have experienced it in the future as well. So that might be impacting how you're feeling about coming to the end of this stage in your academic career and what lays next as well. And that doesn't even cover home life and relationships and friendships, which are, you know, they, they have been strained during the pandemic because we have been isolated, we've had less chance to socialise. And these are really important parts of our life that keep us connected and keep us well and healthy as well. So that is just my very broad snapshot. Some of the things that may have been impacting your mental health you know, in the run up to this quite key transition for you coming up as well. But I wondered whether anyone else in the panel wanted to jump in and think about anything else that might have been impacting this sense um, of change that's coming and anticipating, either whether it's for you pre-pandemic or you reflecting on your experience this year and how that might relate to the people who are in, in the webinar today. I guess to sort of add on to feeling unprepared about moving on to the next stage of studying, I guess there's also the whole fear of, okay, I'm moving to a new school, things like that. Like, I guess if you're deciding to stay, at, whether or not you decide to stay at your school or move to a new one, there is still going to be a change of the people around you and the community that you have to support you. And that's also something that does like weigh heavy on quite a lot of students' minds as well. Like that's definitely something that I had to think about quite a lot. Definitely. And, you know, thinking about, you know, the endings or if you're going to get a new friendship group or you're going to leave some of your friends or some of your friends are leaving where, where you're studying, that's a change as well. And I guess the flavour, you know, a theme of the pandemic has been uncertainty and lack of control. And so if you're feeling that there's more uncertainty coming because you're having to re-establish friendships or make new friends or new beginnings, that can perhaps feel quite tricky at the moment as well. It could feel really exciting and like a new chapter of your life and that, that's really amazing and like harness that, that's really positive. But I guess there's a whole range of experience at the moment and I guess we're trying to just highlight some of the things that might feel a bit tricky. Um, 
Um, Joel or Anita, did you have anything else you wanted to add to sort of this, this slide? Um, I was going to say things like, I know we found it quite strange living in like with a group of students your own age, but you're now having to do like for a long time, you're having to live almost just thinking about everybody else in the world as well and everything you were doing. You have to also think that how that would affect like other friends, adults, um, family members, and you weren't just then acting for yourself to just try and look after you. You also were bearing the responsibility of having to look after lots of other people, lots of them who you didn't even know. Um, and that's quite a lot to always have kind of going on when you're having to make decisions about what you want to be doing um, and what you actually think you should be doing. I think it's a great point, you know, and thinking about that, um, you know, that responsibility and that's you can't get back this year of your life, you know, that you're year 11 or, um, you know, wherever you are in your academic career. So it's like that has gone now and you're going to have that sense of loss potentially because but it's kind of for the greater good. But you might still feel that loss very personally as well. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to move on and, and get in case Anita, do you want to jump in? Um, I was just going to say something I found really challenging this year was the sort of the threat of isolations. I know it's a relatively small thing in the grand scheme of things, but actually that was really stressful, you know, not knowing particularly towards, like you said, for us at the end of term and the beginning of our first term as well. You know, are we going to be around next week? Are we going to be able to do the things we planned on doing? You know, is life going to abruptly stop and how is that going to affect you? And I know in schools that has been something that's a real theme. So I can only imagine that that has actually been a real, real challenge. I mean, I can't even imagine having to sit, you know, mock exams or real, real your kind of your internal assessments this year with the threat of perhaps having to do it from home because of self-isolation, your bubble having to be isolating as well. And that, that layer of, of, of stress and uncertainty, I think um, it can sometimes feel like it, because of where we are in the pandemic, it's no longer okay to feel stressed by it, but actually I think the longer we're in it, the more stressful it becomes. And we just internalise that a bit more and a bit more. So I think if we're reaching a key kind of trigger point, like a transition, we may be experiencing some of the stuff that we've just have felt like we've been containing for a while and it actually just overflows a little bit. Um, so yeah, so those are some things to think about, to reflect on, think about where you'd be putting yourself on that continuum and thinking, you know, again, what we're coming to is thinking about the ways that you protect where you are and try and, and maximise the positive, I guess, and looking after yourself in that space as well. So why is it that transitions and well-being are sort of a package that come together? And um, I would say that in my, you know, in my career working in well-being in education, transitions is always a key point that we talk about because we recognise that change can be very difficult. And as human beings, we quite like certainty. We quite like routine. We quite like knowing where um, our support structures are and how the land lays. And when things change, particularly when you think about a transition to university or transition to a sixth form into a new sixth form, you're having to restart a lot of the things that you know where to get support and how to look after yourself and where, how your, where your friendship groups are. And all those things that really help us feel supported and positive in our, in our mental health can just feel it all stretched. And if that happens all at the same time, that can feel quite overwhelming. And so thinking about the transition, thinking about things that may well change for you in the transition, this is just me sort of putting my ideas out there. And I'd really love to hear if you've got other ones to add to it. But I was thinking about, you know, your friendships might be changing when people are um, doing different subjects to you. So you might not be in the same class as them anymore. They're changing establishments, you know, going to different six forms or different schools. If they've left to go into the working world and you won't be seeing them in school as much anymore. You know, those are all big transitions to navigate anyway, let alone when we've had the pandemic and we may, you may not have seen them as much and had that sort of a memory making time in your last year at, at secondary school. Thinking about teachers, you know, my, um, my last, pre well before this, I worked in a sixth form and actually establishing relationships with teachers as a sixth form student can feel quite different to being, um, you know, in year 11 because their expectations around you and your independence may change and shift a little bit. And I actually found that the students who had been at your level at the school and then went into sixth form found that harder than perhaps the new incoming students because they had this relationship already. And then it shifted kind of overnight over summer holidays and it felt a bit tricky to adjust to. It took time when they got there, but just being aware that that's not a change to be, that's, that you're navigating as well. 
I picked your daily schedule because I thought, you know, how you get to how you get to sixth form might change, you know, whether you're walking, getting new transport, how, how early you have to get up in the morning, all that sort of routine stuff, you know, that actually can help us feel quite grounded and prepared for the day. We might be finding our feet about again around that in September as well. And that's something to factor in. I put independence. I know that often in sixth form you'll have free periods, you'll have to self-manage your work a bit more. You'll um, have a bit more expectation around being more of a young adult in an educational setting as well. And that can feel a bit daunting navigating. It can be really exciting as well. Like three periods to go and get McDonald's at lunchtime, like amazing. But like coming with that, like how do you navigate that time and use it well and make sure that you get all your work done as you know, in, in the increased time can feel a bit, a bit daunting. And workload, you know, I think there's acknowledgement that there is a step up between GCSE and A-levels or wherever you are and wherever you're going. And so thinking about how am I going to manage that, like particularly given the dis disrupted kind of year and a half, how, what does that look like and how can I prepare for that? I think that can feel quite daunting. And extracurricular activities, because if you're joining somewhere new or if there are new people joining where, you're, where, you're, where you are, thinking about who are you going to be doing these extracurricular activities with, what are the opportunities, um, how do you make the most of them, you cast form a personal statement, like how can I work, play and have fun all at the same time in this in this period as well. So um, a lot changes. And I think I want to just map that out because sometimes thinking about it can feel like quite daunting and we can want to like hide from it and run away from it. But actually, if we think about it and kind of like focus on it and make some plans around it, that can be really empowering for us and make us feel far more prepared going into the next chapter as well. And so thinking about what do we do if we know these changes are happening and how do we navigate it? Because actually what we're aiming for is for you to be starting in September and feeling prepared and confident and not with a false sense of expectation about how it's going to be, whether that's really positive, really negative, but actually feeling like regardless of what's coming my way, I know that I've got some tools in my toolkit from what looking after my emotional well-being that I can navigate it. And if I can't navigate it, I know where to go to to get the help to navigate it. I think that's really important that actually it's feeling you guys feeling empowered is really is really key here. Um, so thinking about um, taking things one one thing at a time, reflecting on why that might be different for you. How do you feel about that? Like sit with that emotion a little bit. And then thinking about, OK, what is in my control and how do I shape this to make it feel more positive for me, more doable for me, a bit less daunting for me? I think that's really important as well. OK, so we're going to move on. So here's some of my strategies that I would suggest to you. Um, everyone else, please do jump in and, and add your own. But I think that what's really important is finding ways that you can talk about what's on your mind and what's concerning you with safe people in safe ways. And some of that might be um, professionals in your network, you know, a teacher who knows you really well from, from your GCSEs or a youth worker, or, you know, someone who's got some experience and skills to help navigate that with you. It might be talking about it with your friends or with your people who you live with at home, people who have gone through the process before as well. But I think often we can feel like if, if I talk about this, then I'm gonna be really exposed and really vulnerable and then I'm going to be seen as weak or failing or ready for I've even started. And actually the absolute opposite is, is true, you know, and actually if you sit with all these worries and just percolate for the next couple of months, by the time you reach September, I think our resiliency really takes a hit. Um, and so thinking about safe ways to kind of vocalise and verbalise how we're feeling is really, really important. Finding trusted people feels really important as well. And figuring out who your support network is in September when you get there is a really key part of it as well. The next um, point is about focusing on what's in your control and plan for practicalities. So, for example, thinking about independence, thinking about, well, I'm going to have all these new free periods now and how do I use it? How do I make the most of it? Maybe speak to someone who's a year or two ahead of you and ask how they navigated it. You know, speak with... Um, students are already at the school, people who are just leaving to go to university. Think about it with, your, with maybe teachers who you know quite well and, and ask them and try different things out. I think that we can have an expectation that once you reach a, a new stage, you have to have it all together and all sorted and any sort of um, transition has to be smooth and perfect. 
And actually, in reality, we know that perfection doesn't really exist. It's all about making small steps of progress as well. And so thinking about what is going to make you feel confident and prepared is really important. What things feel really worrying to you that you can perhaps unpick a bit more? And how do you give yourself the best start possible is important. And I'm just wondering um, for Joel, Stephanie and Anita, thinking about focusing on what's on in your control when you're planning for the practicalities. When you guys started um, year 12 or the equivalent, how do you navigate that? And how do you sort of try and plan and feel prepared for, for that transition? Um, I guess when I was preparing for year 12, it was like really the small things, such as making sure that I had like my suit because for my six when we had to wear suits, I just making sure that I had that all prepared, making sure I had my book bag, my pencil case was all sorted out. So it was like the smallest things that I had control over. I wanted to make sure that it was like there and I knew that I had come, I had the comfort in knowing, okay, at least my pencil case is sorted, at least my book bag is packed, and at least I've got my uniform all sorted, just small things like that would really help me. Thank you, Stephanie. Joel and Anita? Um, I, I'd say, I think if anyone's worried about work, just doing a, a functional minimum is always nothing to be worried about, as in, if they told you to read this, I, I obviously I did English A level. If they've told you to read a book, try and read the book. That is that's all I looked at it. I was like, I don't need to get ahead at this point. I've got a long time that I'm going to be working for two years over these subjects. Just don't go in already thinking you're behind. Just go in on the kind of get a baseline. It doesn't need to be ahead of anybody. It doesn't need to be any of that. It just needs to kind of know that you're starting on a very good place with all your work and there's nowhere that you're going to kind of be having to try and catch up whilst also balancing all the other things as well that are going to be maybe worrying you a little bit through that transition. Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. Anita? Um, I definitely agree with Joel there. Um, I remember, I think I got a bit panicky and overprepared and uh, what hit me very quickly was the realisation that all the teachers are assuming you haven't done the work and I think they probably will do, especially in the instance of the pandemic. So actually, if you can do a tiny bit that's a bonus it might make you feel a little bit more comfortable in the next couple you know in the first couple of weeks of term but if you can't they will not assume that you've done it so really don't worry and it actually sometimes for you know sort of science and maths and things like that it can be helpful to get it from a teacher first rather than to sort of muddle your way through it and not really know what's going on so that would be my advice um and as someone who wasn't particularly good at anticipating that there would be things I couldn't control, I kind of forgot that life happened in sixth form. So I was sort of very geared up to do the work, but I was not ready to deal with the fact that actually, oh, I'm an adult now and, you know, my life has changed quite a lot. Um, I would say just be prepared for that. You know, you are moving into a different phase of life, not just a different phase of school. You know, your relationship with the people in your home might change. You know, your expectations and responsibilities might change. You might be getting like a part time job. You know, you might also be doing really exciting things like being in your first relationship or doing something like that. So I'd just be prepared for life to change as well. Like that's a very normal thing and it actually can be, like gave me a lot more happiness than I had in year 11. So you never know. Yeah, I think that's really great advice as well. Like, you know, change doesn't need to be scary or daunting and overwhelming. And that can be sometimes our initial response to it. Like, oh, everything's changing and I don't know how I feel about that. But with it comes so many opportunities and, and yeah, a newness that can be really exciting as well. And I think it's really great that in what's been quite a difficult year and a half, you have a sense of newness and adventure and excitement and opportunities that you really deserve and you've worked really hard to have. So um, to put yourself in a place where you can receive that feels really important as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I've put, so I've put on, going back to my slide, prioritize things that look after your well-being because what I've noticed is that when we get to a transition and we get to a new a new kind of phase or new chapter we can often throw out all of the things that we know work for us in terms of looking after our well-being or um, protecting our mental health and think I've got to be here I've got to work really hard straight away to make sure that teachers know exactly how smart I am I should be going to all the social things so that I can meet as many people as possible, make as many friendships as possible. And you put stuff under so much pressure straight away that actually you burn out <laughs> within a month or six weeks. The first half term is amazing. And then you feel like you just can't sustain that anymore. 
so the things that you've been cultivating, if you have been cultivating during this during the pandemic, the things that you know before pre-pandemic looked after yourself, whether that is exercise, getting eight hours sleep, eating well, seeing friends for quality time, all these things that we know, having a sense of connection and purpose that are really great for our sense of self. Please carve those out once you get to this sixth form or um, going back into you know, post-16 education. Carve them out and prioritise them because they will be the things that sustain you if things feel a bit overwhelming whilst you adjust to the change. And whenever I have a transition, you know, whether it's work or in my personal life, I make sure that I keep one thing that I really enjoy consistently during that time. Because I know that even if I've got like a really overwhelming day and everything feels new, I can come back to something that I know is good and I know is positive for me. And that consistency, I find it can be really, really helpful during a, a time when it feels like everything else is changing as well. So I would say don't throw, what's that phrase, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Keep the things that you know are really good for you. And then maybe adjust them over time as well. And you can kind of let go of the things that are no longer suiting you when you're in this new kind of phase of life. But during that traditional time, I think it's really important to have some continuity in some way, shape or form. Um, Joel, Stephanie and Anita, just thinking about things that kind of protect your well-being and things that you may have prioritised as you started um, year 12 or started university and that's some sort of transition. How did you navigate that in terms of looking after your well-being and strategies? I guess when I started year 12, like I was really into netball back during secondary school. So I did, so I made sure to be on the netball team um, during year 12 and just sort of continued that just so I had some level of consistency. And I also did, gym, I also did gymnastics back um, in secondary school. So I made sure to look for a gymnastics club that I could take part in. So just trying to keep as much entertainment that I had for my old life, just trying to keep that going through that really helped me a lot in terms of managing my mental wellbeing. Brilliant, thank you. Joel, have you got anything you'd like to add? Um, I was a sorry I was I'm mean, quite a keen runner so again I kind of did sport and I just like being able to I used to just go out running on every day on my own kind of a space in which I could kind of think things through um, just clear your head kind of get outside get some fresh air everything goes a little bit slower um, no computers no devices and I've tried to I've even kept my, like keeping it up whilst we've all been learning online I found really good because just to take your eyes a bit away and be able to look at some trees in the distance, I find is a very good way, just kind of calms you down. Um, yeah. It's less buzzy. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. And that, that the sense of space that creates for you is really important as well. I think if things, if you've had like a really intense day, to reset is, is really great. It's a real gift that you can give that to yourself. Thank you, Joel. Anita, is there anything you want to kind of um, throw in the mix? Didn't do a particularly good job of looking after my well-being in year 12, to be honest. Um, but I did a much better job moving to university. And um, I really was just kind to myself. If I needed to do something other than working, I did it. So um, for me, I also really enjoy running um, by myself or with friends, just getting outside. You know, even if you're not particularly sporty or whatever, just moving your body outside is a really great thing. Um, I also love cooking. I take the time to do that. It's just a creative thing. So anything creative that you enjoy doing, I think is actually really worthwhile and really valuable because it makes you think in important and different ways, which I think is something I missed a lot through my academic career. Um, and yeah, just actually taking time to spend time with friends. Um, it's, it is just as good a use of your time as doing work or reading or anything like that. Um, if not more so because you know you've got to do things for your mind and your soul so yeah I would just say really 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 do take time for it schedule it in if you need to like you can put it on a timetable like actually make a slot for it and do it I think sometimes it can feel like doing all of this sort of self-care can feel quite extravagant and actually it's a luxury and we don't need to prioritize it but I think that actually it's really fundamental for us to kind of keep on going and maintaining ourselves and our well-being it's an investment in ourselves and 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 our not our happiness, I think happiness is something different, but you know, it's investing in ourselves and keeping ourselves well. Um, so I think, yeah, that's really important. Joe, I noticed your hand was up. I was just gonna chime in, I just listening to your brilliant kind of self-care um, options. And I, my, my main self-care thing over all the, because I'm completely ancient, all the transitions I've been through in life is has always been just watching random sports. And I just think the Olympics right now, if you, if you wanna feel good about the world, then, just the amazing random sports that are on right now that you can get completely engrossed in. 
like mountain biking I was watching this morning and a lot of taekwondo, although we keep losing, so maybe that's not the best one to be watching right now. But just there's, wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, whatever stage you're on, there's always something totally you can totally uh, zone out to. And for me, that's sport. And you know, now have YouTube, you can just re-watch stuff that you like. So yeah, I think there's, there's an amazing kind of comfort in sport and um, just the fact that the, the, the narrative is... Um, you, you never know what's going to happen. It, it's just really great to, to lose yourself into sport. So that's my top tip. Amazing. That's a great top tip. I watched Tom Daly doing the diving and was like in tears, like, oh, yeah. like, I don't know what hell was happening there. It was really, really exciting. I think that's really good. Um, and, and I think, you know, thinking about carving out this time and why it's so important, I think particularly given, you know, the year that, that you guys have had, giving yourself permission to rest this summer also feels quite important as well. Like, I think it has been really quite relentless and it can feel like, oh, but I've got to prepare myself for what's coming next. I need to be doing my reading. I need to be doing my, my, my activities. And if you've been set work by your six or more kind of for your, for your post-16 studies, do it. But also know that you have worked hard enough this year. You have given enough this year and you deserve to have that break and you need to have that break. So if you can do things that really feed your soul and bring you joy this summer, it's been so hard to find those spaces in the last 16 months or so. Topping yourself up and your resiliency up by really positive experiences this summer is going to be really key, I think, to looking after yourself going forward as well. And um, I often think about if we were a car and we had a fuel gauge, you know, what are our kind of early warning signs as we get to feeling quite empty and our kind of sense of well-being is less positive and more negative? What are those things in ourselves that tell us that? And how can we respond to that in a positive way so that we can top ourselves up again as well? And sometimes that's speaking to a professional and asking for some, some therapeutic input or more social support. Sometimes that's, you know, creating spaces with your friends, with your family, that you can kind of unpack what's going on. Sometimes that's doing things for you that make you feel really empowered and positive, whether that's sport or creativity or things that really kind of, you know, yeah, bring you joy, I guess, as well. Um, and so my last point on the slide is about being realistic and compassionate. And I've put those on there because often our expectations can be something that kind of trip us up a little bit as well. And so if we have had a tricky year 11 and um, it feels really important that year 12 goes well, we can put so much emphasis on it having to be exactly what we need it to be. You don't leave space and opportunity for what it's going to be as well. And it being absolutely fine if it's different to what you expect. It's absolutely fine if you get into the subject that you've been waiting to study for the last four or five years and it's not what you expect it to be. And having those conversations with, with those teachers or if you find the step up to kind of A-level work a bit harder than you think, it doesn't mean that you don't deserve to be in that class or to be studying that subject. And I think being open to the possibilities of what that could be like and saying that whatever happens, like that's okay, and we will have a plan to work through that, feels really important. And having a very fixed and fragile outcome that needs to happen for it to be the right thing for you to be doing. Um, and I think that's really hard because I think that um, we can project all of our hopes and dreams, and it's good to have all these aspirations, but it's also good to have a bit of an agile mindset that if it's not going quite as you want it to do, um, that's still okay and it, we can still make that a success and it be a positive outcome for us as well. And I think sometimes in our mindset we can catastrophize and that means that if um, we experience something that's a bit um, tricky or a bit negative we then go it's all ruined and, and it's rubbish and I'm rubbish and I can't do it anymore and I shouldn't be doing it anymore. Um, and actually I think it's about giving ourselves that compassionate self-talk of like well this is harder than I thought it would be, it's okay that it's harder than I thought it would be where can I go and get some support around this as well? Um, and so I think just trying to, to think about that, prepare yourself for that, build that those sort of that self-talking at this point feels really important. Because then if you do reach something that feels a bit tricky in September, October, November time, you will have that mechanism of like being really compassionate towards yourself, being really understanding and allowing yourself to figure that out with the people around you as well. And I was just wondering if there's any expectations that perhaps Joel, Stephanie and Anita have experienced either going into year 12 or going to university, which um, either they were able to kind of like make sure those expectations are really helpful, and really healthy, or were able to kind of modify any expectations that might have tripped them up along the way as well. 
um, thinking about you know the next chapter of academic study and how they prepared for it. But when I was um, like, I was a bit worried because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to Oxford, what are we going to do? It's going to be work, work, work. I'm going to have to be in the room working every day. Um, so I just tried to tell myself that, you know, in the end, like, it is just work. It's just an essay. Like, if you need to put it aside to go and see your friends or have a bit of time away or whatever it is, um, the kind of, however much you build something up in your head is it's going to be difficult. You can always try and take a step back. Um, and I think with A levels as well, or whatever it is, that next academic challenge can also can always be quite daunting. And nine times out of ten, you've built it up more in your head than it actually will be. And you'll be able to manage the things you do because that's what you did the last time you were worried about something. Um, so just trying to basically uh, make sure your expectation doesn't get away from you, and you can kind of go, actually, no, it's going to be all right. We'll be able to keep doing everything else. Yeah, like I so, um, I completely agree with what Joel said. Um, I definitely had like the same sort of realization. But like when I was coming, when I was going to Cambridge, I had the whole mindset of I'm going to study physics. I'm going to be at the top. I'm just gonna like constantly be grinding basically, and yeah, it didn't really pan out like that. Um, but I guess one thing that sort of got me through is like every so often I'll just tell myself to calm down like I always felt like I was like I was running a race but then I was the only person in the race so who was I really racing against and it's just a sense of like telling myself to calm down relax like things are going to work out there's no reason why they shouldn't even if they don't work out as I thought they would in my head they're going to work out regardless so it really is a sense of just calming down just life is a marathon not a sprint all of that just really taking my time and enjoying the ride. Um, I think for me, when I was going from GCSE to sixth form, there was a lot of talk about like this massive leap that was gonna happen from GCSE to A-level. And I, I actually didn't find it for a lot of my subjects. And I think in part that's because of the altered GCSEs that came in a few years ago. Um, but I think also just because people overhyped it way too much, like it, it wasn't that awful. Um, like obviously it's different for everyone but I think you know basic principles still apply like just try your hardest to understand things ask for help when you're stuck um I think just a good piece of advice generally for anyone who's learning anything is you know keep making sure every time you leave the classroom you understand everything you've been taught and go back and ask for help if you haven't just so it doesn't build up to the end of the year when you're like ah there's this whole module I never understood and I didn't bother to like get anything done about it so I'm um, I, that still applies and everything is definitely manageable and I can promise that regardless of where you are if you ask for help someone will give it to you so yeah absolutely and I think probably my final two points before we open up the Q&A is first of all this is what Anita said and um, thank you so much Joel Stephanie and Anita for your contributions that was so helpful but you know asking for help is perhaps the biggest life skill that I encourage people to start practicing as soon as possible there is no shame in asking for help and actually your teachers are going to want you to be asking for help and each school or college or sixth form wherever you're going is going to have a network of people who can support you no matter what comes up and so asking for help and identifying that is really really important so please 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 do that and um, when you get there and and second of all it's very easy for us to think about things from like a very negative point of view so change is coming it's going to be overwhelming i've got new subjects to study it's been a pandemic like it can feel like it's negative, 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 negative. And actually, if you think about it from a strengths mindset, think about the things that you have learned, things that you have grown, think about who you are and all your positive attributes. Like your teachers are lucky to have you in their class from September. You know, you've got so much to bring um, to your studies and to your community that you're gonna be joining or that you're gonna be part of continuing um, from September. Like thinking about all the things that make you great and are gonna make you a success going forward. Like really focus on those and give those, selves, those space because we can be our harshest critic. But I love um, Brene Brown talks about speaking to yourself like you speak to someone who you love. And actually we can pour out all our compassion and our, our generosity and our care to our friends and family around us and not give any of that back to us as well. And so really during this, this summer and as you pre prepare for this, Remind yourself of all the things that make you amazing and really hold on to that. And it can feel really cheesy and a bit, but actually to know who we are, know what our strengths are, is really a protective factor for our well-being going forward as well. So, you know, 
try affirmations around your bathroom window, bathroom mirror, so you're brushing your teeth and seeing like, I can do this, I'm really studious, I'm a great friend. Remind yourself of all these things because they can get lost when we're very stressed, but it doesn't mean that they're not true anymore. They will remain true. And it's really important to hold on to that as well. Um, okay, Catherine, can I hand back to you for the Q&A? Thank you so much, Mary, um, and the students for, for all your thoughts chipping in. And um, we've also been answering a few of the, the questions so far um, by typing. So do have a little look in the answer column if you haven't seen those answers already. Um, I think Mary was also going to quickly pop on a slide on the screen with a list of resources. Um, and we can circle um, circulate these um, as text in an email afterwards for anyone who who can't see that on the screen I and mean, it's basically links to to different um, aspects of, of further support that you can get as as young people if you've got any concerns about your mental well-being and um, but yeah for this next part of the session we're going to be answering all the great questions that are coming in and so many of them have lots in common so if you're sat there thinking I'm the only one that feels this way um, about going into your 12 you're absolutely not we have over 100 people attending this evening um, from all across the UK who are having the exact same kind of experiences and concerns and um, but yeah we, we're gonna address them them now and um, the first few questions that I'm going to ask we've had a few people asking about how do you deal with results day and um, especially as someone who's a perfectionist and um, well how do you kind of manage your anxiety around results day and one of the things that was helpful to me and just trying to think back was I remembered I went um with a few friends for like just go and have a dinner at pizza express beforehand or something um so i know it's a little bit harder now but if you can just try and do something just kind of go at it almost as a team or take your mind off it a little bit um you've already you've already put the work in if it's results day um and it's always it's over a lot sooner and a lot in a lot more nice way than you're going to expect i'm sure um everyone's always really supportive and really helpful and everyone's just there um to look after you um so it was i think it is it is tricky it's not a nice day and no one ever enjoys results day especially the morning but if you can try and kind of just if you know there's other people who might be thinking the same as you because i tell you oh mate just try and like support each other um and go yeah don't because you're not going at it alone everyone's in the same position and everyone normally comes out of it completely fine And for my results day, um, my GCSE results day, I remember the like tactic I had is that I was literally just going to walk in, collect my results and leave. I was not going to open my results around others because I didn't know what the outcome would be. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know if, I would want, if I'd be in a happy mood or a sad mood. I didn't know how seeing other people's reactions would affect me. So I just wanted to be surrounded by my family because especially like it helped that no one in my family also had GCSE results day to collect, GCSE results to collect, but um, just sort of not being in the same environment as other people who were opening their results really helped me. I think something I did that kind of helped the anxiety in my, if your brain works in a similar way, help you. Um, just know what practical action you might need to take maybe before, if you're, if you're suspecting maybe something hasn't gone quite right or you know, this was a really tough year for you, you know, just have a little look up and see what's your school's like system, you know, who do you need to email or phone or something and just have that ready. So if it is for whatever reason, maybe not how you expect it to go or maybe how it is you're expecting it to go, just that you've got that ready. You don't have to think about it too much. You can just send off that email, make that phone call and it'll be done. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. So in my previous role, I worked results day um, for GCSEs and A levels, and I think it's a real, a really emotional day. It's really quite a heightened emotional day. There's quite a lot of drama that happens. So I think keeping yourself as grounded as possible feels really important. To remember that your initial reaction may not be your final reaction, and to allow that sort of space to kind of unpack things. And if you need to get, get some space, please do so and get some support. You know. Or, I don't know how results days are working kind of in the pandemic, but if they're, you're going to be able to go into school and speak with your teachers about your results, that's probably going to help because they'll have seen all results before and all students before, and they'll be able to kind of figure out with you what the best next steps are. But I think, you know, again, feeling grounded and having a plan was really important as well. Thank you. And we've also got loads of questions about the, the step up in workload from, from GCSE or equivalent to A-levels or equivalent, so moving to post-16 studies. 
Um, a lot of people saying, you know, do you need to revise every day after school? Um, is it ever OK to be behind on homework or is that going to like set you back for assessments at the end? Um, and basically, can you can you still do <laughs> any fun stuff in free periods um, or outside of school? Or basically, what is that work life balance like when you switch to post 16 studies? Um, I'll go first. Um, I guess like back when I was in sixth form, one thing that really helped me in terms of academics was, I guess I don't know if it's like the best advice, but it was something that did help me was that I had a study partner and I made sure, okay, because we were both sort of very work driven and we just wanted to like sort of be on top of things. We were just like, okay, we're going to work when we're in the same space together. So we'd work in the mornings, like during break times, during lunch times, and then a bit after school to do our school work. But it just meant that when we got home, we wouldn't do any work whatsoever. And why I'm saying I don't know if this is the best advice is because I know that for some people, like like the break time, break times and lunch times are literally designed for you to have a break and for you to relax. And there's definitely no harm in doing that. Like do that if that's what you feel like you need. And it all depends on who you are and your work ethic and those sorts of things. But having a study buddy definitely helps in times of like sort of seeing where you lie. Like even if you can't see the whole cohort, cohort and see where everyone else is in terms of academics, knowing that you've got someone that's working with you, someone that can push you in terms of how long you study for, how much work you do is always really beneficial. Um, in terms of the revising every day after school, I, controversial opinion, really do not like um, like study tubers, like on YouTube, the people who do like, oh, 16 hours study with me, hate it, I absolutely hate it because I've never done that, I've never, never done that and I would always feel awful when I watched it, particularly, you know, doing an Oxbridge application, I was like, oh my god, I'm not doing this, so I'm never going to make it into Cambridge, but um, it's, you don't need to do that, again, I would say the most important thing you can do and I think the thing people really forget to do is just understand what's going on in your classes um my sixth form used to throw around the word extra work a lot and I'd often be sat there like what is extra work like I'll do reading if I need to do reading and stuff like that but it can feel like there's this sort of mysterious extra thing you have to do to get really great a-level results and actually just understand what's going on in your classes and go from there because it's only once you've understood anything that you can you know add the cherry on top so I would really just emphasize if you're going to do anything extra you know go and talk to your teacher about that test you didn't do so well on or you know that concept you didn't find super easy to grasp um I didn't use my breaks as well in the day like Stephanie did um but I did study at home then so I mean like there has to be a bit of you know a little bit more workload than GCSE but again if your emphasis is just on making sure particularly in term time before exams and stuff that you do understand things you can take it up to the next level when you're revising for your mocks so like when you actually really need to do the work so you don't end up burning out. Yeah I think they're both great I would also say you are as soon as you start A levels you're going to look back and go how on earth did I used to fill my day with a class in every hour like the, your free periods become really helpful to you because you either use them for work or they're a little break and then you can go again in the next class um so your day is already kind of a lot it will be a bit more it will feel a bit more spaced out you do have a bit of breathing time which I really liked um but also don't I found it was really unhelpful sometimes to look around too much because you'd see there'd be like people with a full fo three folders of perfectly highlighted notes and I'd like and half a flashcard and had to go and get a pizza or something because I was a bit tired and that's kind of fine if you're comfortable with the amount you're doing and you're kind of talking to your teachers looking at the work you're producing and going you know I'm very happy with what I'm doing I'm feeling good with myself then don't feel like that yeah there's this whole extra like course you could learn if you had like the dedication to do it because that's not what it's about necessarily it's do everything you can to do well in your A-levels, but also look after yourself, carry on with your hobbies. I kept running and doing lifeguarding and had, so I had a job all the way through my A-levels because I found it suited me to balance my time around things. But if you're someone who'd rather work consistently, watch some telly and go to bed, that might be what you prefer to do as well. So try and explore and find that balance a little bit because um, you've got enough time to get it wrong a few times as well.
Thanks, everyone. Um, somebody's asked, would the loss of education that most of us ha have had during this time affect us in the future? So university and jobs and things like that. Um, Joe, I feel bad for you because you haven't spoken in a while. So I might fire this, this question at you. So me and my college and my boss uh, as well have been thinking a little bit about this recently, funny enough, and we've been looking at the kind of evidence and the research that's coming out. And I just think that, you know, if we're, we're not going to forget COVID, it's going to be something that everyone, employers, educators, everyone in the future, you know, it'll be a big asterisk next to 2020, 2021. Um, and we'll all know that your education was disrupted during that time. And I think the, the I hope the support and the help and the kind of taking that into account and understanding is just going to be enormous. It's not going to, it's not like a localized thing. It's all across the entire world. So I would feel optimistic. I'd feel hopeful and happy about how uh, we're going to regard the kind of COVID period in the future. And I think we're, we're going to be putting so many measures in place to support and to cater for and contextualize, you know, what you've experienced over the last year or two. And it, it goes really deep. Like my kids are eight and no, hang on, they're 10 and seven. And I think we're going to be talking about, you know, the effects on uh, COVID for, for primary school students as well. So it's, we're talking about decades and decades of, um, you know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a long time till we forget COVID and we stop taking into account. So actually, I would, I would not stress yourself out by that. And I would not feel like you know, you're going to be disadvantaged and there's going to be all these people who didn't have educational disruption who are going to be ahead of you in the employment market and other things like that. I just feel that you know, we're, we're not going to forget this and we're, we're going to be taking it into account and hopefully supporting and helping people for, for many decades to come. Someone's asked, what strategies would you recommend for reducing anxiety about change? And um, so I might point that one at Mary, if I may. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think for anxiety is a couple of things. I think, first of all, uh, responding to the physical um responses to anxiety as well and so trying to to manage I guess whether that is panic attacks or just feeling very anxious in our bodies and how that impacts things and so knowing yourself knowing your the, the early warning signs or your triggers is really important and thinking about um, mindfulness or breathing exercises so that you can feel you can bring that feeling of panic or anxiety down if it comes in quite intense waves feels really important. Um, I think sometimes change provokes anxiety because it feels out of our control or um, really overwhelming and so I think it is responding to, to the physical sensations and having a plan around that but also trying to unpick what is it about the change that feels particularly daunting or particularly overwhelming for you what are some of the core beliefs that you might be holding that are getting pressed upon when you're thinking about change whether it is like, I'm not going to be able to fit in or I'm not going to settle well or um you know, I need to be perfect in my new educational establishment and unpacking that with someone who you trust feels really important as well because change is really daunting and um, I think it is a natural response to feel nervous about it. But if it feels like the anxiety um, is perhaps more than you'd like it to be, speaking to an, an adult in your life who you trust um, would be really a really good place to start, I would say. Thank you, Mary. Is a kind of follow up to that. Um, someone's also asked, how do you deal with feeling like overwhelmed and anxious um, without feeling like you're ignoring it or pushing away whatever's bothering you? Um, I'd also love to hear the answer to this, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a really fine balance, isn't it? Because I think that um, we can sometimes, as a response to protect ourselves, we do push uncomfortable feelings, thoughts, behaviours away because that doesn't feel safe for us. But I think there is a... Um, uh, a skill to be to, to be learning about sitting with things that feel uncomfortable and saying I know this is uncomfortable uncomfortable but I also know it may not last forever and therefore if I look after myself during this period of feeling uncomfortable it's going to pass in some way shape or form there's a really beautiful um quote about from Matt Haig and he's he's written um reasons to stay alive and he talks about our moods being like the weather and so that some days it is raining, some days it is sunny. It doesn't mean that we are the rain or that we are the sunshine. It's just the environment around us that's impacting us as well. And so we're trying to separate, I guess, what you're feeling from who you are is important. We experience a whole range of emotions 
throughout the course of a day, throughout the course of a week, throughout the course of our life, and allowing ourselves the space to move through those emotions feels really important um, and not to attach ourselves meaning to that emotion, I would say. Um, I think it's a really tricky skill and I think that um, it takes time, but I think knowing that um, you, if you know how to look after yourself in those moments, that's the most important thing, I think, and things will um, subside or feel less intense in time as well. Somebody said, will it be likely that the start of year 12 will be online? Um, since I think it's quite worrying that that might make it harder to meet new people and to learn new content. Obviously, at the moment, it's so difficult to know whether things are going to be online or not. But um, Joel and Anita, especially Anita, because you're a first year, I'm not sure about you, Joel, but you'll, you'll have had to get to know a lot of people and deal with a lot of new content online. How did you find that this year? And what advice would you have if that's what happens to these people going into year 12 and equivalent? Um, well, I mean, for me, what was really strange was my degree is very small. So um, Cambridge is like lots of different colleges. Um, so I'm one of two people doing my degree at my college. So I actually didn't meet anyone else doing my degree until this term, which was really, really strange. Um, and uh, I would say there are definitely benefits to working online. I really enjoyed having recorded lectures. I really enjoyed being able to take my time with things. Um, and in terms of getting to know people, it's always really strange because whenever I pass them on the street, I don't know whether I should acknowledge that I definitely know who they are because I've definitely seen them in loads of lectures and classes. <laughs> but it, it's, it's really weird. It is really, really weird. And I definitely empathize that it's not the most natural learning condition, but I think it is possible um, to still learn well. Um, I've found other ways to socialize, even though I have met some fellow theologians recently this term. Um, you know, I think if you're worried about learning online, trying to find extracurricular activities, maybe even outside of school, if your school's not offering anything in person, um, you know, whether that's maybe like a sport that's in your local park or, um, again, I'm a big ad advocate for doing creative things. So maybe like a crocheting club or a knitting club or something. Um, online communities are still great. You know, join a chat group, like a group chat, even, sorry, not a chat group, group chat. And, you know, do make the effort to try and speak to people like, I hate Zoom. Zoom makes me feel, mm. and doing a lot of the like pre-university socializing on Zoom, just, I did not enjoy it. But, you know, I would just try and push yourself, put yourself out there, because there are definitely lots of people who feel like you and who will be struggling. Um, again, same principle applies. Do ask for help. One-to-one um, -one lessons with teachers on Zoom is very strange when you've like asked for a bit of extra help, but it's definitely worth it. So just do keep on reaching out. Um, putting yourself out there, pushing yourself, like it really is worth it. Yeah, I think it's hard because everyone's kind of obviously sat at the end of their computer and you all feel like, well, well I don't want to be the one who has to kind of break the ice. Um, but if you're brave enough to be the one who takes the plunge and kind of says, oh, shall we all have a Zoom chat this evening or something? Normally everyone's so grateful that it's some form of like, opportunity to make these friends they will all say yes so i know we've had we had a, the occasional meeting where we'd all sit in silence and someone would go oh finally ask a question like oh what did you all have for dinner and the answers are flying in and you're hearing all about it because everyone is in the same situation as you um and nobody else is also i think the worry is you're kind of missing out on things but i know especially talking to our first years um they all were like well I thought we'd all I'd get here and there'd have been people who'd already made friends all online with the people who are coming to uni or whatever and no one had been um it's just some people kind of it is tricky to kind of get a perspective of things sometimes um and worry that you're not going to make friends but everyone is normally in the same position um and therefore very keen to also get involved in anything um and you will meet people that way as well somebody's asked Part of me is scared I won't be good enough when the work gets harder. So Mary, do you have any advice for some worried about that the step up is going to be a bit too big moving to post-16 studies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's really difficult because it's, it's an unknown, first of all, isn't it? And so you're trying to pre predict and preempt what the work's going to be like and, and how you respond to it. But I guess what I'd encourage you to just think about the meaning you're attached to, whether you find it hard or not. I think it's OK if it feels a bit difficult or a bit of a step up. That's kind of the point of, of A-levels. And so if there's a transitional period where you 
are trying to figure out new skills to, that you need to learn to adapt to being in, in A-level studies now or thinking about new ways to, to kind of manage your time or talking to your teacher a bit more than you perhaps did in year 11 about stuff. That's all okay. There's no failure attached to that and there's, there's no weakness attached to that. That's you upskilling yourself to respond to a new challenge and to a new context as well. So I think it's, I can understand the concern about it, but I think if you say, I'm going to give myself an opportunity to learn and grow and develop in this new academic arena and do, do all the skill, develop all the skills I need to, to do that. And that, that's, that's amazing. And that is like a growth mindset that's going to put you in a really good position going forward as well, because you will have more transitions coming up and more new um, unknowns coming up and um, you will know how to navigate them as well. Um, and I think as well, it's a really common, common worry as well. And Anita spoke about it and said, actually, it wasn't that big and that, and that was OK. And that might be your experience as well. It's just a really smooth transition. So I think trying to preempt um, that it's going to be really hard, perhaps is going to ang and provoke more anxiety than you need to as well. So being open to whatever it's going to be will be. And I know that I have got strategies to manage that. Feels like quite a good way to kind of be thinking about it at the moment. Thanks, Mary. Um, very last question of, of the evening. Thanks to all the students that, that have stayed on. Um, someone's asked, um, how do you basically, how do you avoid getting burnt out? And if, if you feel like you're getting burnt out, um, how do you deal with that and bounce back to, to being productive if it's possible? For me, for me I think um, burnout is, is perhaps trying to think about balance. And I really like the idea that balance is maintained and not achieved. And so it, you're never going to be like, I've got everything perfect now and I've made it and it's a brilliant. It's a continual adjusting, trying new things, shifting things, depending on what happens in the week and what's happening in your life as well. And I think allowing yourself that flexibility to be always reviewing what's working, what's not working and trying to find a rhythm that works for you feels really important. I think that's probably how you try and avoid that sense of burnout. I think there are really poor times in the year and in the next two years where you do feel more stressed than perhaps you do at the moment because, you know, mock exams, exams, all that sort of stuff, it is a stressful time. And so you may feel a bit more, more stretched. And that's also kind of okay as long as you can look after yourself for that kind of finite period of time in, 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 in your studies. Um, I think how you recover from burnout is to acknowledge that perhaps the balance has been a bit off, speaking to people about it and allowing yourself to kind of replenish. So whether that's that's kind of sleep and rest and joy and connection, as well as practical things like having a plan to catch up on work that you may have slipped behind on or talking to your teachers and kind of having those adjustments. Because I think something that happens at A-levels that may not happen at GCSE level is that your teachers you can approach them and say, I can't meet this deadline, can I put in an essay plan instead? Or um, I'm really struggling with this reading and can I have an extension? Um, because they're, you're a bit more independent and because you have that different relationship with your teachers, they can accommodate that most of the time as well. And it's having that kind of honest conversation that's really important as well. So I think that's also something really important to try and cultivate as you can start this new, new chapter of, of your kind of academic career. Um, I've spoken too long. I'm going to hand over to, to John or Anita. Have you got any? Yeah, I, no, yeah, it's all very good. I was going to say, it's quite like, obviously, we, I study one subject um, and it's the subject I love the most in the world. So it can be quite tricky to think when it's something you know you really enjoy, why do I not want to do it as much all of a sudden? Um, and I, I remember having that feeling with A-levels, like I really like what I'm doing, but I'm just far too tired to do it. And sometimes you just, I've said, I've typed it a few times, but try and just do something which is kind of connected, but you're not going to be examined on it. It's got nothing to do with your essays or your homework or anything. Just try and if it's like, for me, it's go and read a book that has nothing to do with my degree, but it's just fun. Or like, yeah, watch a documentary, you know, you're going to enjoy or something, which might kind of try when you're feeling a bit more ready to get that spark back, because it's not that the thing you've suddenly turn away in disgust of something it can just be you've just done too much of it all of a sudden um so trying to forget the love back for like the subject you properly enjoy is often just yeah try to try to find why you enjoy it again and I find that's a good way to kind of pick yourself back up and get going 
I would say for me, burnout didn't actually look like my grades plummeting, which might be the case actually for a lot of people as well. Um, for me, my academic work is usually the last thing to go. So I think it's just as important to pay attention to when you're not doing the little things that you used to do for yourself or when you're, you know, when you know you're struggling, but it doesn't necessarily look like it to any of your teachers. And, you know, what I had to do at that point was go up to a teacher and be like, I know nothing looks like it's wrong, but it really is wrong. And they actually fully empathized and they actually had noticed that something was up. It wasn't just all going on in here. So um, just pay attention to all the bits of your life. Like I know school feels like the most important thing and I, you know, it, really might be in your life but it's not it's going to end very soon so it's really important to work out how you can look after yourself as a human being and find times to do things that are just for you um you know I during the summer of pandemic I just ended up doing a lot of things I hadn't given myself permission to do in ages like art and reading books that were completely irrelevant to anything I needed to do in life and actually I found that those made me feel far more secure in who I was and what I wanted to do and all of those sorts of things which is actually honestly far more fulfilling and makes you feel far more grounded as a person so really make time for those things too thank you so much we've had so many excellent thoughts today from from mary and joe and the students and um, stephanie also emailed to say her laptop crashed so um, that's why she quickly disappeared um, but thanks so much to everyone who's attended this evening and asked all your brilliant questions. And um, this is the start of the summer for you, like we've been saying, you know, take a bit of a break. And um, we've been through a lot in these last 16 months. And like, like everyone said, it's not all about the work in this period. And um, I popped a few links in the chat there um, to, to Joe's College, the Instagram, to where you can chat to some Cats Cambridge students. Um, and also to the website where you can find recordings from our webinars in this series. If you've come along to lots of this year, thanks so much. We hope you've enjoyed them. If this is your first one, welcome. Check out our website and have a little look at the other kind of webinars that we've run and we hope you'll find those useful. Um, and Joe and I will be in touch at some point via email with um, resources and events in the future. Thanks so much, Mary, for leading this session. Thank you everyone for a lovely evening and thanks for staying over. Have a nice evening. Bye everyone.